people walk in and they're like, is this a tattoo shop? Like, yeah. it, it actually doesn't sound like a traditional tattoo it's shop invisible. anymore. The machine's so quiet, we're gonna have to add in, like, fake tattoo noise. We'll be like, mm -hmm. If you're Japanese, it's like, once you start using electricity, you've already sold out, right? <laughs> I feel like Taki and Tomo's tattoos really reflect the personalities. Taki's a very strong-minded person. What you see is what you get. If he's tattooing a dragon, it's a dragon, you know? And it's a huge dragon, it's a gorgeous dragon. With Japanese tattooing, we're talking about the, the history and the culture of a nation. He was the bridge between America and Japan. He's put out books. He's done crazy art shows. He's done museum exhibitions. You work through the fatigue, blood, sweat, maybe some tears, but you must persevere. It was groundbreaking for the Japanese American community. When you look at a Tomo tattoo, you understand there's a lot of depth to it. Everything he does is very deliberate. I think he obeys enough of the traditional rules and then breaks enough of them to have created his own style. I think Horitomo is at like a next level. Ooh, I can't even try to describe it. To me, it's just inspirational. As far as them in America being ambassadors for Japanese tattooing, I couldn't think of two better people to do that. Yes, sir. Taki works in a more pared down, bolder style Japanese tattoo. Solid color, solid background, real clean lines, and he does it right. What color do you decide to go with? Red and gold, just to match the samurai. Yeah. I'm not like the graceful guy, I'm not the super detailed guy. I just want my pieces to have impact. Maybe part of this is being raised in America and my love for American traditional, but I love the boldness and the simplicity of American traditional, and I, I'm trying to find a balance there because I, I like that power. When we petitioned to bring Horitomo here, we got him an O-1 visa, which is a person of extraordinary talent. I felt like it was something exciting for tattooing. <laughs> He was such a powerhouse of energy and art that whatever he did, he was good at. He has so much to say. I think in five lifetimes, he wouldn't run out of art. There's definitely a mystique around him. And I feel like that mystique doesn't go away once you start getting tattooed by him. I feel like it builds. Okay, so, go ahead. Yeah. When you look at a Tomo tattoo, it's got bright colors, crisp lines, and is extremely powerful. There's really a few influencers in the world, and I think Hori Tomo is definitely one of them. Feels a lot different. Yeah? How does yeah. how, how it? It's good. good? I, like, I like the sound. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's, uh, it's That's fun. good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he really does act as my older brother, because I'll constantly pester him with questions. You know, can you look at this drawing and that sort of thing. They are intertwined. I feel like they need each other. They just have that kind of chemistry. Growing up as a Japanese American, I think there was always a calling, a romanticism, a desire to know more about Japanese tattooing. When I was in junior high, high school time, I started reading the Tattoo Times by Ed Hardy. That's when I first saw the work of Hoyoshi 3. I don't think any Japanese tattooer will ever have the impact that Hoyoshi 3 has had on the world. To me, he's the Ed Hardy of Japan. Taki and Horitomo, the apprentice with Hoyoshi 3, which was probably got to be one of the most incredible experiences you could have. Japanese tattooing is one of the great tattoo art forms. It has a foundation on tradition. 
So that's always going to give it a backbone and more soul, and it's going to make it timeless. We try to do as much as we can where the whole suit tells a cohesive story. He obeys enough of the traditional rules and then breaks enough of them to have created his own style. I think in Japan, a lot of the older generation, like tattoos weren't something you showed. It's widely believed that these forms were originally made so that tattoos could be hidden easier under kimonos. At this stage, it's more of just like a look. We just don't have the uh, good image in Japan, including my parents, you know what I mean? Yeah. They hated it the when I started tattooing. I think the origin of anti-tattoo sentiment in Japan has to do with the fact that the government at, at certain points in history used it to mark criminals. Are other people in your family tattooed? Uh, no, <laughs> not really, no. And here we have this art form that is loved by everyone all over the world except for the Japanese people. I think it's very important for me as a tattooer that I impart some sense of knowledge to the client. And I think as part of Japanese tattooing, like, it's a necessary requirement. The samurai that I chose for Garrett's back is Musashibo Benke. He's an actual real historical figure. And he was said to be really big. Garrett's a big guy, and I've always kind of felt that tattoos should sort of fit and reflect the person that they're on. And so when he asked me about doing his back, I was like, you know who I think we should do <laughs> is Benke. So I thought it was a perfect fit. Garrett, do you remember how, how long this took? This one took 50 hours. Okay, 50 hours? Yeah. Anything you want to say, Garrett? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks, buddy. <laughs>
Very early on in my career, I got my back tattooed by Horyoshi 3, and he took me on as an apprentice. I was given a, a, a golden opportunity. And I remember even asking him, like, how am I going to learn how to do this Japanese stuff? Like, there's so much to it. And he was like, well, that's what I'm here for. And that's what a master teaches an apprentice. I don't remember that. Well, I remember when um, Horitomo first uh, went from Washo and became Horitomo and joined the family as our, our senior apprentice. I think the, uh, the human side of me was a little bit worried and slightly jealous because we all knew of Washo, even in America. We all knew him by reputation. Horitomo was tattooing for, I think, 10 years before he met Horiyoshi. Here's a guy that established his whole career on American traditional tattooing, and now you're starting from scratch. He wanted to go to the top, so he apprenticed with one of the greatest Japanese tattooers that are living now, and he took what he learned from him and just added his own flavor to it. You know, he's doing things that nobody's really done yet. Horitomo has a three to four year waiting list right now. And we're to the point where I'm asking people to write physical letters and have them mail them in. Just to kind of weed out people that, you know, just make the phone call and get on the list and then, you know, kind of yeah. waste everybody time. The actual teachings of how to do hand tattooing are pretty basic principles. It's more that you have to have the perseverance to actually continue in that style. I think that's another reason why I really respect Horitomo's dedication, because it's like going from having a motorcycle to a bicycle. And you'll get to the same place, it's just going to take you a lot longer, and you're going to have to work a lot harder for it, but maybe you'll appreciate that journey more. So one thing I was going to say that's really nice about our shop location is we're in the middle of Japantown here in San Jose. Being on the second floor allows us to be in the middle of it, but you know, a little bit off the beaten path. With State of Grace, one of our points was that we wouldn't advertise. Like, I don't really want the kind of clients that look at Yelp or want to look in a phone book. I want people that, like, seek us out. I think it's really important that we find the right clients because essentially you're entering into a, some sort of a relationship. Anyone can walk into a shop and get their neck tattooed on a drunken Friday night, but to get, like, a back piece, to get a sleeve, like, you're talking multiple visits and a lot of trust on both sides. Right now, one of my longtime clients, he has a full bodysuit for me. Um, I think I've tattooed him for over a decade. What's up, dude? Come in. Come in. He uh, competes, he teaches. He's also a CrossFit instructor. Let's go, Wilson. Open up. There we go. We got 10 seconds. Give it everything you got. Time. Good job, guys. Okay, good job. I started with just a sleeve in remembrance of my brother and went to the left side for myself. I was reading all his books and stuff and I was just like, I really was fascinated with the bodysuit. We both like the idea of doing a phoenix. So it's a little bit um, maybe like uh, unorthodox, but you know, yeah, I think- uh, But it pops very well. Peter's bodysuit shows a lot of different parts of my career just because I tattooed him over a seven year period. This design is actually a design drawn by Horyoshi 3. When you're a Japanese apprentice, it's very normal and almost uh, sometimes required to use your master's designs. I think I will always uh, carry a lot of gratitude and respect for Horyoshi 3. But since then, um, you know, I've chosen not to use his designs as a show of respect since I've left. But I think this right here sort of captures that moment in time. Like, showing that guy Peter's back was actually, like, kind of a big deal for me. Yeah, you seem to be Yeah, just because certain tattoos mark certain times of my life and, you know, things change in life, you know. There definitely is a lot of emotion there. You call somebody father for 10 years, and then that relationship, you know, inevitably ended. 
I think it's very hard for me to describe being a member of a Japanese tattoo family. There's so many mixed emotions and uh, you know, I think in one sense like I felt this profound sense of honor and that I was part of a legacy of something larger than myself. At the same time, there's the weight of that, there's responsibility. I was often asked early on, why, why would he choose you? You just started tattooing. Um, you know, why wouldn't he want someone more experienced? And I think that the you know, question and answer is all there. He wanted somebody that was moldable. And also, he was looking to go global with his family. Taki was more or less Horiyoshi's liaison to the rest of the world, because Taki could be Horiyoshi's voice. My time with Horiyoshi came to somewhat of an abrupt end. It happened shortly after I watched my father die of cancer, and uh, just emotionally and responsibility-wise, I just couldn't do it anymore. And I've been criticized for that from some people. Um, it's the tattoo world, so never to my face, of course. You know, my answer would be like, well, you know, if you've served 10 years in a family, then maybe we can discuss it. In Japan, they would have an apprentice, and that apprentice owed you until the end of your life. You gave them a life, a way to provide for them and their family, and then they have to provide for you. As far as Horitomo and myself, I think we had just developed this bond of friendship and we were already working together out here in America together. And so it was kind of natural that he'd stay out here. To be an artist in a country where most people are like, oh God, that's the worst. You know, or like, you're all degenerates. You should be locked up. You shouldn't be allowed to do what you're doing. You know, it's tough. あまり良くないと思うよ。なったんです。それでターキーに電話して、あの、そのことを伝えたら、あの、ま、心よく僕のビザのサポートをしてくれることを約束してくれました。ま、それでお世話になってる3代目堀吉先生のところを辞めるの
we realized that, you know, okay, we need to make some books, prints, shirts, things like that. And that quickly went out of control. You know, Molly was like spending a lot of time shipping everything out. And it got to the point where we needed to get into real manufacturing. So we've done that. We've actually taken that to a company level. I'm obviously one of Horitomo's biggest fans. And, uh, you know, I just like seeing his stuff out there. Where's the cat? My cat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a bedroom. Oh, OK. She's very shy. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Tomo, you know, coming out here and Taki really, you know, helping Tomo promote his career here and, and start it in the United States, I feel like they have this relationship that is very special. Corey Tomo and I have uh, worked complementary and, and been very symbiotic since the day we met. Within the family, too, we sort of knew our roles. He was like the big art guy and I was more the spokesperson. With every event that I've spoken at, what I've noticed is that we'll get people that would never walk into a tattoo shop, but here was a safe space where they can like look at this stuff. And the response was overwhelmingly positive. I do believe tattoos are art. You know, I don't think we're like any other type of art out there, but I do believe we do have a place in the art world and the museum world. <laughs> I was told by my ex-master a long time ago, don't chase money or fame, just do good tattoos. And if you do good work, everything else will fall into place. And I think that's essentially what we were doing, is we we're just trying to, you know, make good tattoos and uh, not worrying too much about the rest of it. Thank you.